How did the concept for Space Warp come about, Pat? Well, um, I wanted to uh, put something back, to give something back to the industry. In other words, um, uh, you know, having spent a, a lifetime in comics, I, I wanted to, um, uh, you know, I was very aware that uh, comics today are not in a good place. And in particular, they've lost their, uh, their young readership. So arguably, there's not that many people under, what shall we say, 25, 30 even, uh, who regularly read British comics. And um, meanwhile, uh, graphic novels and uh, things of that sort, uh, you know, go from strength to strength. So um, I, I think if you consider that comics started with kids, uh, I think that's where they really need to come back to. So the idea of Space Warp is a, a comic uh, for all ages, a science fiction comic for all ages. Now, uh, those words for all ages do not mean that it's going to uh, be toned down or, or, or young or juvenile in any way. That's, I, I've never produced comics like that. I'm certainly not going to start now. So that's what it was all about. And um, well, it had to be science fiction because we live in a science fiction world. So how did you come to recruit the artists for the comic? Um, it wasn't that difficult. Um, I want, this is another thing, I wanted to attract new talent. And later when you, uh, you know, when you're talking to some of these artists, you're, you'll see what I mean, that these are, these are great artists, but they're relatively new uh, to the business. And I felt uh, that there was a generation of artists who, for one reason or another, weren't actually uh, getting out there uh, in comic land. Um, so I really wanted to encourage new talent. And there's another reason for it as well. Um, I found over the years that if I tend to use new talent, it often has, they often have the edge over, um, over some other artists at least, because uh, they're still, fresh-eyed and bushy-tailed, if you like. They haven't been worn down by the system, um, uh, which does happen a lot because the, the financial model on which British comics uh, are based is uh, debilitates talent because uh, it buys all the rights. So you don't own your own characters. You don't control their destiny. So that was the attraction uh, when I asked um, uh, when I put the word out there, uh, I'm looking for new artists, and uh, I got um, many, many responses, and uh, it took a while to find the right guys, and, uh, and I've got them. Great. Um, can you tell us uh, about the type of stories that we should expect from this new publication? Uh, sure, sure. Um, well, when I did 2000 AD, it was the comic of the future. In other words, it was a future that was, um, um, what should we say, a couple of decades away at the time. Um, but we now live in that future. We now live in the science fiction world. Um, so that creates um, a real difference. It's no longer, oh, this is an incredible uh, future that's, uh, you know, 50, 100 years from now. I mean, if you look at uh, what's happening uh, at the moment where we're, we're all in lockdown. I mean, that, that's quite science fiction uh, by itself. Um, so, to specifics, I'm just looking at my, um, uh, the, the early advert for uh, Space Warp, which says, Space Warp will upload your brain to infinite Earths, galactic war, alien invasions, virus armies. Space Warp is space cops, mutant secret agents, killer robots, and much more. Um, so that's, those are the stories in, in a nutshell. And um, uh, specifically, uh, could you maybe go through some of the names of these stories and give us a flavour of, of what to expect? Absolutely. Well, um, we have, uh, now th this is a very rough version. Uh, this, th 
just uh, this was the, the two-page ad, and I, I don't think it has any, at least it gives you some visual definition as to what we're talking about. This took uh, myself and uh, Lisa, my partner and, uh, and, and publisher, 50 hours to put together this far, and now it's with the art editor getting a, a kind of final polish, which will probably involve another 20 hours. So, uh, taking it um, uh, bit by bit, we have, uh, in fact, actually, I'll show you on this. We have executioners, right? And the advert for executioners says, 62 moons, 62 realities, one police force. So this gives you an idea of some of the early designs for the character and uh, all the various processes that we, we went through before we finally decided, right, you know, this is, this is the, one of the heroes, this is the other hero and, and so forth. And then we have uh, Jurassic Punks, uh, this story here, uh, which is Street Fighters versus Dinosaurs. Now again, this is just still being put together, but this is SF1, Special Forces 1, um, uh, who are at war with a giant virus army. Now, uh, these horrible creatures here that are kind of a, a cross between War of the Worlds and the Daleks, um, we actually came up with them a year ago. Um, uh, and, and of course, well, it's turned out to be, um, uh, what should we say, a worthy enemy. <laughs> we really want to see these guys get blown away. Um, then here we have uh, uh, Slayer, also known as Shock, and uh, it's uh, one robot against uh, a million uh, space, space knights. And then here with uh, Hellbreaker is uh, De La Rue um, escapes from hell uh, to take uh, vengeance on the living. And finally, uh, over here is uh, Futant, which is a phrase, um, which it basically it means uh, future mutant, but it's a kind of um, um, uh, shortened version. And uh, so he's at this uh, kind of school for mutants in space. And um, well, this guy, as you can guess, is the, is the bad guy. So that, if you like, is, the, is a sort of overarching uh, uh, thing. And then we have uh, other stories, uh, various features and other artists contributing as well. So it's, um, it's that classic uh, British anthology only by its very nature uh, is much longer because um, I think the days when you can have a three page story are probably long gone because uh, you want to get into a story. So uh, th these stories on average are about uh, say 10 pages long, something of that sort. And, um, and they're more or less complete within themselves or they have ongoing threats because I think there's nothing worse uh, than the traditional British comic, which tended to end on a cliffhanger. And you think, oh God, I've got to wait till next week or next month or whatever to, to find out what happens next. So um, I'm aiming for reader satisfaction because there will be gaps between uh, this uh, first, um, first issue, phase one, and uh, subsequent uh, phases. Um, how long the gaps will be, well, <laughs> I suppose it would depend on, on a lot of things, in, including the lockdown and, uh, and so on. Um, we're going to start off um, with uh, a digital launch um, because, uh, well, physical launch isn't really uh, re feasible at the moment. I mean, everybody's indoors. Um, so in terms of availability, it will be available as a digital download. Uh, print on demand. So, in other words, you can. There'll be details of how to come to uh, the Spacewalk site and and on Amazon and uh, get your uh, uh, paper copy. Um, 
and uh, it will also be available in comic shops and probably uh, on some newsstands. So it'll be the whole spectrum, really, of, uh, of distribution. And could you tell us some future plans for the publication? Um, well, uh, more of the same in the first instance. Um, the first thing for me, really, I suppose, after phase one, would be to slowly bring in new writers. Now, that, that's um, the reason I wrote uh, all the stories is because I wanted to create a cohesive universe. And, um, uh, but at the same time, I not only want to encourage uh, new artists, but in the long run, I want to encourage new writers. But that's easier said than done because um, there are rules within, say, uh, writing for television or film, which I would want to apply to comics. And that may or may not suit every writer who perhaps thinks that you just sit down and write whatever comes into your head and we'll all be bowled over by it. It doesn't work that way. The rules of television is that the, um, the, the creator of a particular series lays down the ground rules and the, and, and the tram lines and you stay within them. Um, that, to my knowledge, hasn't really been done in British comics, but it would have to work that way. From a story point of view, uh, there is a central theme and mystery, uh, which is, uh, there's an overarching quest, um, uh, apart from the individual story. So you can read all the stories in, in isolation from one another, um, but they are interlinked. And again, this is new for, for British comics. Um, 2000 AD, um, we have a theme of science fiction, but I wanted to go beyond that. Um, I didn't want bogus crossovers, uh, which I, I know, uh, you know, I've seen in Marvel and DC and I, I'm not impressed by, where, you know, the characters cross over just so people will buy more comics. Um, I wanted this crossover to further an overarching quest, which is to do with some very mysterious events, um, which um, is actually based on something in real life. And I'll, I'll just say very briefly what it is. Um, there's a mysterious church in the Pyrenees in Spain, which is like something out of a Dan Brown novel, because it's the only, it's the only church that has paintings of the apocalypse in it. All the other churches, uh, medieval churches, have uh, more regular uh, Christian imagery, but this one has um, paintings that are straight out of a nightmare. And I was shown around it by uh, an archeologist and he explained to me how it's really bizarre and no one knows the reason. Well, in the best tradition of Dan Brown and, uh, uh, and, and his kind, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great thriller explanation there, which is explored through the different stories. There, there is something in that church that the various characters, good and bad, uh, want to get their hands on. Okay, great. That, that really sets the, the scene, I think, Pat. And uh, finally, I think, um, um, should uh, people who want to get hold of this in the first instance visit your, your website, uh, blog, what's the best way to engage in the short term until we have an actual release date? Um, well, we, the, we should have our website up uh, in the next few weeks. Uh, as we, so if we're talking, say, I don't know, um, three weeks from now, um, it will be spacewalkcomics.com. And uh, that's where it will be. And I suppose we'd probably be taking advance orders from somewhere around that point. Um, which means, you know, it, it will be posted up on Amazon somewhere around about that time. I think the thing, uh, there is an exciting thing working on a comic like this because traditional comics, when you, you, you have a deadline and you, you sort of say, right, it's got to come out on that date, come hell or high water. Well, um, that's not the case with Space Warp. It comes out when it's absolutely perfect or as perfect as we can possibly make it. So if it gets delayed by a, uh, a week or something like that, that that's just part of the course. Um, 
Yeah, and I should also mention, by the way, the slogan for uh, Spacewalk, which you'll, you'll see on the front cover, is do not adjust your reality, um, which I think is particularly relevant in, in uh, the times we live in because you really do feel like you've entered some kind of dimension warp and that we're in, I don't know, uh, either a, a Doctor Who sequence or... Uh, or, or a scene from The Walking Dead, you know, with all these silent streets. And I, I, think, um, I think the mood and the tone of Spacewalk uh, very much reflects the world we're in. <laughs> okay, well, thanks very much, Pat, for taking time out uh, to record this. And we'll be following this up with uh, some interviews with, uh, with the other creators. So uh, we look forward to, to seeing uh, that and the publication coming out. Thank you. Smashing. Thank you, Phil. Thanks.